Hi, and thanks for tuning in for another piano review. I'm Stu Harrison. I'm here at Miriam Pianos, and we are just outside of Toronto, Canada. We're going to be focusing on the Steinway. That's what I'm in front of right now. Uh, now, the example that uh, we're in front of right now is a used example, but it's one that's in incredibly good shape uh, and fairly recent. So this is uh, from the 5.6, 5.7 million serial number range. So we're well into the 2000s with this piano. Certainly a really good example of what Steinway is um, currently putting out. Um, and besides a few very small differences, uh, is going to resemble a brand new Steinway uh, sold in 2000, 2017, 2018 uh, quite well. And I really enjoy playing on this piano. The Steinway B has for probably more than a century been the benchmark by which most seven foot concert grade instruments are measured. Um, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, if we go back to piano design in the late 1800s, where piano making was still very much in an experimental phase. You had instruments coming out with uh, different sets of keys. There were some with 85 keys, some with 88 keys. Uh, you had instruments coming out with two pedals, three pedals, four pedals. You had some uh, instruments where even the way in which the action was being built was really completely different. Uh, this was an industry still very much in, if not its infancy, still in a growth stage. Uh, lots of consolidation, lots of design work going on. and. In amongst all of that uh, uh, growth and innovation, uh, Steinway set up shop in New York and started one by one chipping away at the technical challenges that were still plaguing piano design right from uh, the about the well started in uh, 1853, but um, going right through the 1860s, 70s, 80s as Steinway will. Um, uh, usually quite enthusiastically remind us of, there were hundreds of patents uh, that were filed for this piano. Um, and they were solving a lot of the problems of the day and improving piano design uh, to a point where they really did give us the basis for what pianos looked like throughout the 20th century. And so of course they deserve a ton of credit for that. And a lot of those innovations that are now more than 100 years old uh, still uh, have application in today's piano uh, market and pia today's piano uh, design uh, paradigm. So the Steinway B is just under seven feet long. I think they uh, call it a six foot 11 or six foot 10 and a half. Uh, the scale design has been around uh, for quite a while and this instrument, like several of the other models, has some really interesting um, uh, design features, construction features to it. Like all the Steinway Grands, their inner and outer rim uh, is constructed in, in a single laminating process of hard rock maple. Now, any musician who uh, works with instruments where wood is part of the primary resonating surface, like a drum uh, or, of course, string instruments, that also applies to, will tell you that uh, the type of wood, the thickness of the wood, how the wood is dried, has a really big impact on the tone that that piano presents. And uh, Steinway making the decision to use uh, solid hard rock maple and also the, de the decision to fuse both the inner and outer rim together really in one uh, construction process has given Steinway uh, one of the hallmark tonal traits, which is this um, almost impossible to distort mid-range clarity that a lot of other instruments, uh, even when they have tried for that tone, have been unsuccessful in attaining. And so uh, the fact that they're using the hard rock maple uh, gives the piano an incredible uh, projection. Other instruments made of this type of wood, uh, a lot of drum makers use hard rock maple, uh, will we'll talk about the projection and talk about uh, the clarity that maple brings because it just it doesn't really distort even when you're putting a lot of energy through those fibers. And so for a piano initially built for power, and clarity and dynamic range, which the Steinway definitely was, uh, maple was an ideal choice. And so they're using maple in the bridges, vertically laminated maple and maple cap. You're using maple through the rims. There is, without a doubt, no other way to describe a, pian a Steinway piano other than this piano uh, is, if you wanted to know what maple sounded like, you just need to listen to a Steinway. Um, it, it really has a massive influence over what's going on in the tone. And a lot of people don't necessarily think about that. Um, and the reason I'm making a big deal of this is when we then listen to the Beckstein, or when you're comparing Steinways to other pianos, um, if you look at it through a constructional lens, 
Um, the difference in the woods that are used, all of a sudden you start to realize why there's such a big difference in sound and why there's such a big difference um, in projection or dynamic range uh, for instruments using maple versus not maple. Uh, so that's one aspect of, of the B or also the D as well. Um, a second one is to get around the fact that when you use maple, sometimes your trebles suffer a little bit. Uh, one of the things they do to get around that is, of course, Steinway invented what they called their treble bell or their treble resonator. I have heard uh, it described online, and this is incorrect, so it's an opportunity to correct this. The, that bell that you see, and we'll, we'll get a shot up of it on the screen uh, for you to see, this is not something that was designed to help retain crown in the soundboard. I've heard this talked about in a few other videos, and this is an erroneous myth. It has nothing to do with uh, soundboard crown, actually. And if you really look at how it's constructed and how it's attached to the piano, and you've got a bit of a mechanical mind, you'll look at this and go, yeah, why on earth would that actually be contributing to helping the soundboard retain its crown? It doesn't. Uh, what it does do is it connects uh, one point in the piano, um, essentially the plate, right at the point where the treble bridge and those treble strings are connecting, um, with one of the more difficult parts of the piano rim to get resonating. So it's essentially taking frequencies, which Maple normally doesn't do a great job of, um, which is they're really, really high frequencies, and it's kind of uh, compressing and amplifying those high-end frequencies um, and really jamming them into the rim of the piano. So you actually get some liveliness out of the treble. Um, sometimes when people are looking at Bs and Ds and the piano is sounding a little bit dead or the trebles don't feel like they're really projecting that well, um, often the thing that really, really expert technicians will then go in and start to adjust, please do not do this at home, uh, but the expert technicians will start to adjust is actually that bell. That's one of the biggest uh, influences over how to get the top end of a Steinway speaking. So that's another feature of this. Of course, Steinway became really famous as well for the control and the dynamic range that their action produced. And, and the accelerated action uh, was one of the big innovations in this area. So you get an instrument that is very responsive, uh, has a really uh, fast um, uh, repetition speed on the action, um, and a piano that rather famously uh, almost doesn't seem to have a top end in terms of its dynamic range. You can keep pushing a really great Steinway more and more and more and more, um, and you never really hear it hit the ceiling. Um, and so that's a combination of a lot of the things I've just talked about, along with a lot of other minute uh, design details that for those who are really keen, you can go in and you can do a little bit more research. So the bottom line is, Here's a piano that has literally changed history, that we owe a lot to, uh, and has a really distinctive tonal sound and projection. And a lot of that is not coming from the fact that it says Steinway. I mean, that sound came from very specific designs, uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they were using maple, that it has this, uh, this treble resonating bridge, that it's this, and uh, that it's using a high tension scale design, and the whole thing is designed uh, to just produce this uh, incredibly clear, uh, projecting, uh, sustaining, um, mid-range focused uh, tone. And of course, it's, it's it really changed the piano industry and the music industry as a whole uh, for you know, about another, uh, at least 120, 130 years. Um, and so we'll be uh, certainly doing some playing on this uh, so that you can hear it. Um, but just quickly, I'll play a little bit on it and you can hear uh, what I'm talking about uh, in terms of just that mid-range clarity.
a great sounding bee and certainly always a solid choice for somebody looking for um, uh, an instrument capable of a lot of range, a lot of dynamics, and that applies to somebody thinking about uh, a recording studio, uh, a finer instrument for your home, a church, or of course uh, an institution. Um, that said, uh, just because Steinway uh, was able to correct a lot of the failings of older piano design and give us an instrument that was capable of a ton of dynamic range, an accelerated action, uh, and a lot of clarity in the mid-range where other instruments had um, previously failed to deliver that, certainly does not mean that there is no room for further evolution in the design of pianos. And that's where it's going to be really exciting to actually take a look at the next instrument, which is, of course, the Bechstein 212. Now, the Bechstein 212 is interesting because uh, it draws not only on a lot of the innovations that the Steinway has given, but it also draws on some of the innovations that some of the other um, well-known uh, piano brands from the early 20th century through the rest of the 20th century has also given us uh, from brands like Bösendorfer, Blutner, and Fazioli. So we're going to take a look at that next, and uh, thanks so much for sticking around. We're going to switch pianos, and we'll be right back. Sun is